All right, it's going to be a long four hours, but we can get through it, okay? <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. All right, so this is going to be the last section uh, that we're going to be covering as part of Farm 2. Thank goodness we saved the best for last. This is my favorite. Uh, to start out, though, my, uh, my daughter was watching some Planet Earth this morning, and I thought up uh, another really good dad joke, if you guys will indulge me for just a moment. Where did Adele say hello from at the zoo? The otter side. <laughs> I don't know if I did this wrong. Anywho, um, so this last section is on toxicology, and so depending on where you're working at, what your environment is, you may run into this more frequently than not. Uh, if you're working in the ICUs, working on the floors, working in the emergency departments, you're certainly going to uh, run into this with some regularity. Um, but don't discount that. You know, working in even you know um, typical family practice kind of setting, you can still run into this pretty frequently, whether intentionally or unintentionally. Um, but just to kind of uh, going over the basics, we'll cover a few specific drugs um, in terms of how to manage those toxicities, what they actually manifest as. But just as a little bit of background, um, if you have a poisoning emergency, does anyone know who you call? Pretty close. It's 1-800-222-1222. One, two, two, two. It's a very easy number. We like to keep it easy. Uh, it's actually based off your area code. So if you have, say, a cell phone from Texas or somewhere, you'll actually end up with a Texas Poison Center. Um, so that's why it's important if you're like working in the hospital, always call on a landline unless you have a local uh, phone number. Otherwise, you get right to the wrong Poison Center. Does anyone know where the Poison Center is right in Florida? There's one in Jacksonville. There's one in Tampa. And there's one in Miami. And so basically, we divvy up the state based on um, based on area code. And so, for instance, like Miami, they have a you know it's much more densely populated down there, so they only cover a couple of counties versus like Tampa, gets most of Central Florida, and then we get kind of the Panhandle up in Jacksonville. I say we because that's still the poison center they take call for. But anyway, so who can be a toxicologist? Does anyone know? A farm D can. Now, specifically, I can be a medical. I cannot be a medical toxicologist. I can be a clinical toxicologist. There's a little bit of a delineation there. Talk about that in a second. So a PharmD can, an MD would be a medical toxicologist, so there's a little distinction there. And actually, we've had some nurse practitioners, I'm not sure if we have any PAs or not, actually go through and get become a clinical toxicologist. I don't know if there's anything blocking that from occurring, though. Um, and so basically what I did was I did a two-year fellowship uh, in toxicology and emergency medicine and got my training, uh, and then I eventually went and took my boards, and so I became a clinical toxicologist, uh, which is a little bit different than the medical toxicologist. Does anyone know which docs can go on to eventually get their fellowship in medical toxicology? Like what they, that's usually a secondary fellowship they're doing? Not usually infectious disease. No, we don't deal with a lot of that in, in tox. Uh, not internal medicine. That's emergency medicine. Uh, occupational health is actually another one. Uh, you may actually see them going to because they deal with a lot of like occupational exposures, um, you know, things like lead, things like, um, you know, asbestos, things like that. And then pediatrics is another one. So they'll do their initial uh, residencies in one of those three, and then they can go on to be, uh, become a medical toxicologist and an additional fellowship. Um, but anyway, yeah, so we, we take calls basically from everyone, right? And so when you call the poison center, you actually, it will probably end up, at least in Florida, getting uh, probably a nurse uh, to initially talk to. And they're usually nurses who are probably a little bit farther on in their career, maybe where a desk job is a little bit better uh, lifestyle for them. But usually they're ER nurses and they're ICU nurses who've had years and years of experience. They're usually quite salty uh, dealing with uh, some of these poisoned patients on a routine basis for many years. Uh, but they're excellent at what they do. They're very, very good. And then if you need additional help or you request a consult, then you'll get either the clinical toxicologist or the medical toxicologist. And there's always a medical toxicologist for every poison center. That's kind of like the ultimate backup because they assume responsibility for all the uh, people underneath them, essentially. But anyway, um, so getting into this, let's talk about toxidromes. Anyone know what a toxidrome is? Toxic syndrome, that's a good guess, absolutely. Basically, it's a com combining two words together, uh, toxic and syndrome. And basically, it's the, the signs and symptoms that say you get poisoned with a certain substance. 
how you're going to be presenting to the to the provider. And so um, oftentimes you're going to find that when we have people who are either overdosing on things intentionally or unintentionally, um, there can be a lot of mixed pictures. There can be a lot of unknowns uh, in terms of history. There can be a lot of different things. We don't know specifically what we're dealing with. And so a lot of times I don't even want the person to tell me what they think the person took if I'm taking a call from someone, say, in the emergency department. Often, just tell me what their signs and symptoms are. What are the vital signs? What are the what are you seeing on that patient? What are you hearing? And that can oftentimes will inform me as to what is probably coming up with the differential, what could be affecting that patient there. But anyway, um, if you ever hear the difference between toxin and toxicant, um, oftentimes we'll probably use them interchangeably there, but toxin just refers to anything that's naturally uh, occurring. So for instance, you know, uh, botulinum toxin, you know, if you want your patients to look very pretty, but also why is botulinum toxin so bad? paralytic, right? Just like it paralyzes those little muscles causing the 11s. I just learned those are called the 11s. Uh, the same thing can happen uh, to your diaphragm, right? No good. Um, snake venom, all those things. We'll talk about snakes a little bit later. And then toxicants is basically everything else. So any kind of pharmaceutical product you consider to be a toxicant. Uh, again, just a little bit of naming, uh, you know, kind of persnicketiness there. Anywho, uh, the toxic drugs we're going to cover include cholinergic, anticholinergic, sedative, hypnotics. Notice that we've already covered a lot of these already, so hopefully we'll be able to answer all my questions when I ask you about how should these things be presenting, right? We've covered a lot of mnemonics about them already. Uh, the opioids, uh, sympathomimetics, and then we'll also talk about some withdrawal syndromes because oftentimes they can mimic some of these other toxic drugs, as we'll see here in just a little bit. So um, starting off with cholinergic poisoning, anyone know some substances that would fall into this category? We talked about some recently. Hmm? Well, so this would be cholinergic poison. This is actually be the opposite of that, right? So basically, this is anything that's going to be causing increased effects of acetylcholine, either at the nicotinic or the muscarinic receptors, there, right? Um, and so most often, this happens due to inhibition of acetylcholinesterase. If you remember, acetylcholinesterase does what? Breaks down acetylcholine, right? Absolutely. It's a very fast enzyme, but it's one of those things where once you deplete that enzyme, as we'll see with some of these substances can do, um, you're going to find that it takes a long time to regenerate that. And we'll look at some issues of, of why, you know, uh, cholinergic poisoning can be so deadly potentially. Um, but again, you're going to be seeing probably either nicotinic or muscarinic, probably a combination of the two, depending on the substance, right? Now, however, if I were to have, say, someone who were to uh, consume, say, for instance, we had a small child who were to get into, say, an e-cigarette refill cartridge, right? Had the liquid uh, in there and they actually drink all of that, which would you expect to see? much more of the nicotinic side effects, as we'll see. So sometimes there can be much more specific to one versus the other, but oftentimes it's going to be a combination of the two. Anyway, um, so if you ever hear of organophosphates, does anyone know what those are used for commonly? They're insecticides. Yeah, they're kind of older school insecticides. They're very good at what they do, but they're also quite toxic to uh, human beings. And, and in fact, in most developed countries like the U.S., you won't find a ton of organophosphates being used commonly, especially for household purposes. Uh, but if you go to other places, if you go to underdeveloped countries or places where they're um, maybe much more, um, you know, say poor, sort of like farming communities, you'll find a lot of organophosphates being used there. And in fact, in some countries, there are a ton of um, overdoses that happen from organophosphates every single day. Some countries don't even have enough ventilators in the the country to support all the overdoses they have because you have a farmer will have a bad crop one year and they're like all right well, that's it we got no money we're done so they just take a whole bunch of this and try to end it but uh, if you ever hear of them uh, include things like parathion malathion um, chlorpyrifos you know and, and then more commonly you might run into the carbamates carbamates include things like physostigmine neostigmine now where do we talk about neostigmine recently hmm? uh yes i could see that So it reverses anticholinergic effects, certainly, because they're acetylcholinesterase. And we talked about in surgery, though. Remember, we talked about with the paralytics. We talked about trying to wake a patient up a little bit sooner when you have a, a was it a depolarizing, non-depolarizing we were using there? The non-depolarizing, right? So your rocuronium, your vectoronium, cystatricurium. If you want to kick those paralytics off of the receptor, you could use it again. Um, you could use a acetylcholinesterase inhibitor to do that, right? So neostigmine is a common one you'll see used in surgery. Um, pretty frequently. Physostigmine, sometimes you'll see that used in the ER to help treat anticholinergic poisoning, but then in, in and of themselves can actually cause a lot of these effects as well. Okay, so if you accidentally got too much neostigmine, you can have some effects of this cholinergic poisoning you'll see there. Okay, um, there's also, uh, if you ever think about things like VX nerve gas or Soman or Tabin, anytime you hear about nerve gases being used uh, for a terror attacks, very frequently these are acetylcholinesterase inhibitors as well, right? And so, kind of a, a thing I was thinking about in my mind when I was a kid. 
Has anyone ever watched the movie The Rock? Most of the gentlemen are shaking their heads. It's a great movie, right? Nicolas Cage, Sean Connery, awesome movie. Um, but they had VX nerve gas they were using, and these uh, American soldiers were going to launch VX nerve gas. Anyone remember the very beginning of the movie where they drop one of the things, and the gas leaks out, and the guy's face basically melts off? It doesn't work like that. I was very disappointed to find out it's not what the drug actually does. But we will talk about what it does here in a second and why they are potentially so dangerous. Yeah, they're they're pretty pretty nasty from, from that standpoint. So, so what happens here? So looking at acetylcholine esterase, usually you're going to find that you'll have acetylcholine here that will be broken down by the enzyme, and you have these binding sites that happen here, right? And so normally you break it down to acetic acid and choline. So good so far, right? So you can actually recycle the choline. You can be produced back on the neuron and then release more acetylcholine a little bit later there, okay? What will happen, though, is if you would have, say, something like an organophosphate uh, come along, it can actually produce a covalent bond here with the acetylcholinesterase. And so that organophosphate will then basically inactivate the acetylcholinesterase. And so then what do you think will happen to the levels of acetylcholine? They're going to go up pretty precipitously, right? You're going to be finding you have a lot of extra acetylcholine because that enzyme is now being bound up. Now, again, some of these things would cause reversible binding. Some of these are going to cause irreversible binding. Which one do you think would be more serious? The irreversible, right? Because once that enzyme is bound up, that's it. You have to produce new acetylcholinesterase in order to reverse those effects there. So that is what we're worried about with some of these uh, organophosphates. That's what we're worried about with those nerve gases like somin, tabin, etc. So as I mentioned, the organophosphates cause irreversible aging. And for that to occur, it takes time, right? So that, co that covalent bond there is what we call aging. And when that occurs there, then the enzyme is done. So normally what we like to do is try to get there and give therapy beforehand to try to prevent that covalent bond from occurring, OK? Um, this could be minutes to hours. Minutes is going to be more seen with those nerve uh, agents being used in, uh, say, by terror attacks. Um, organophosphates tend to be more on the side of hours. Obviously, the more time we have to work with the patient, the better off we're going to be. So that is something to consider there. The carbamates are going to be reversible, right? So neostigamine's effects don't stick around forever. They're going to go away eventually once the drug gets metabolized and out of the system. So those typically are going to be much more safe uh, from an overdose standpoint because I don't have to have the acetylcholinesterase regenerate itself. I just need the drug to go away, essentially. So what is the old way we used to use um, our mnemonic to remember what the cholinergic effects were? Well, and then again, these are going to be the muscarinic effects specifically. And there's, this is the old way to use sludge. So patient would be, and that kind of makes sense because you think like, what are the effects you know, with someone who has cholinergic poisoning? Extra fluid, like they're leaking fluids out of everywhere, right? So there's a lot of sludge coming out of them, right? That's the way people used to think about it. But the problem was it was missing a key component there. If you remember, what's the mnemonic we use nowadays? They use dumbbells, absolutely. So now we use dumbbells because it includes what we call the killer bees, right? Now, is anyone going to necessarily, you know, pee themselves to death? Probably not, right? No one's going to cry themselves to death. Oh, there's probably some emo individuals out there who felt like they were going to. Not going to happen, though, right? However, if you're braiding down, you're not perfusing, that can kill you. If you have bronchorrhea and you can't ventilate, you have bronchospasm, that's going to kill you, right? So we include the killer bees there to remember. Those are the big things we're really worried about for those patients, okay? That's why doing like your lung exams is really important to look to see if they're starting to sound really wet and, and nasty. You need to get rid of that because that's going to be the thing that kills the patient, right? Uh, but again, dumbbells, we know this, defecation, urination. Remember meiosis here? Due to those cholinergic effects, and again, these are muscarinic effects. You expect to see meiosis. Remember, it's going to be a little bit different when we get to the nicotinic effects in just a minute here, but bradycardia, bronchorrhea, bronchospasm, emesis, lacrimation, and salivation. You're going to see basically fluids coming out of everywhere. Patients are typically incontinent when they're presenting with this, um, and so you need to be aware of that. You need to be aware of things like you know, getting a Foley in place, so that way they can just go ahead and pee and the liters and liters of fluid they're going to be peeing out. Um, you just know they're going to have defecation, you know. Make sure you're prepared to replace those fluids because, again, they can get dehydrated if it goes on for long enough, right? The nicotinic effects, I remember what was the mnemonic we used for that? Days of the week, okay? So the nicotinic effects are important here because this can cause mydriasis. Now, again, if you had someone who had presented and they say, oh, you know, I'd been exposed to organophosphate, let's like say you had the bottle of the, the insecticide uh, with them, 
and they present and they have midriatic pupils, you may falsely say, well, this can't be an organophosphate because they should be meiotic. Typically, you can see the nicotinic effects actually kind of present initially. Those are going to be the kind of the first things you're going to see, and then eventually the muscarinic effects kind of take over. So early on, you may find they present with mydriasis. They may be tachycardic. And again, tachycardia is not consistent with the muscarinic effects, but certainly you'd expect it with the nicotinic effects. You see that weakness in the fasciculations. Now, why do you get weakness in fasciculations? Mm -hmm. Yeah, basically you're overactivating the skeletal muscle, just like succinylcholine. Remember how succinylcholine activates the nicotinic receptors on the muscle, uh, neuromuscular end plate and causes activation of the muscle, and then eventually leads to weakness, and then what? Paralysis, right? So this is the big thing we're also worried about with these patients. So not only are their lungs filling up with fluids, they're getting bradycardic, but now all of a sudden the diaphragm starts to weaken because we're overactivating it from the nicotinic standpoint. So you can see why this is really important from an airway standpoint, and very frequently these patients need to be intubated. And in fact, if they have the aging process go on, these patients may need to be intubated for months potentially, okay? And again, being intubated for long periods of time, is that a problem? Yeah, why? What happens? Infection's a big one, barotrauma, um, you know, having a patient laid up for that long pressure ulcers and you get DVTs, all kinds of bad problems, right? So those are things you want to, to try to avoid there. But just know that the fasciculations of weakness go hand in hand with the nicotinic effects and how they interact with that skeletal muscle. And that's how I think about succinylcholine, how these are kind of related from that standpoint. Both of them are activating nicotinic receptors. What are the CNS effects can you expect to see, right? So you have things like headache, confusion, ataxia, delirium, things like that, right? Seizures are also the big thing you can see with this as well, right? So the big thing um, for most of these toxidromes is to know which ones are going to be causing seizures because when you have a patient present with seizures of an unknown cause, you're going to have a pretty wide differential. And so cholinergics are one of those things to keep in mind, right? Now, has anyone ever heard of the, uh, I'm trying to think of the name. There's a there's a, a chemical attack. You can look this up. There's a, a chemical attack in uh, Japan that happened. There was a, a cult um, that had released a, uh, one of these nerve agents here onto a uh, subway, basically. And so when the patients presented to the hospital, I guess one of the first presenting signs where they, they noticed wasn't seizures necessarily. It was actually the mydriasis. That was actually one of the first things they noticed with the patients. And that was helpful because if they saw that or they saw the overt cholinergic effects, they could actually identify patients who may have been exposed versus those that weren't. Now, again, if you're thinking about and if you ever get a chance to participate in like mass casualty events, they're going to find that you have, um, whenever you have an event like this occur, do you think you're only getting sick people presenting to the hospital? No, you have a lot of well people who are thinking, oh, I might have been exposed. I should probably go get checked out just in case. So very frequently, hospital systems will be overwhelmed by so many people showing up um, that it's hard to, to differentiate. Okay, who's really sick? Who's not? Especially if you don't even know what the substance was in the first place. So that can be very helpful if you can try to come up with a case definition. Be like, okay, well, patients who are you know developing you know excessive secretions, they have just mydriasis. You know, those are things you're gonna be looking for to say, well, this is probably what we're dealing with. Anyway, so how we're going to treat these patients if they were to have a true blue cholinergic poisoning? For obviously, ABCs are always going to be the first thing for them, right? Especially if they're a little bit more on the cholinergic, the muscarinic side of things, you're going to find they're going to be having a lot of fluid in the lungs. They may be getting that diaphragmatic weakness. Airway support is going to be the biggest thing. Another thing I have to think about as well is like, what is the substance actually put in? Like, what is it actually dissolved in? And in fact, a lot of those organophosphates come in hydrocarbon bases, right? Things like you know petroleum distillates and things like that. Now, in and of themselves. They get, go through the GI tract, they usually don't cause a whole lot of issues. However, if they get in the lungs, that's where they can cause what we call a chemical pneumonitis. They cause a lot of irritation to the lungs, and that can, again, kind of further complicate the, uh, the respiratory standpoint for that patient there. So that's another thing to consider. As far as decontamination goes, we'll talk more about this more specifically in a little bit, um, but one of the big things you'll find uh, is that because these products tend to come in lipid-soluble sort of compounds, um, how do you wash that off of the patient? So if you think about it, if you're ever like handling, I don't know, if you get like olive oil or like oil on your fingers and you just run it underwater, does that really work to get it off? What do you have to use? Soap. You already have to use soap, right? Because that's going to saponify those fats and get rid of that. Same thing happens here. You want to make sure either using some sort of like um, dilute bleach solution or some kind of soap and water in order to get that off of the patient there. So again, if you had a patient who presented this, oh, accidentally, you know, spilled this all over my hands and you can actually see dermal absorption, make sure you use soap and water. The water itself is not going to be enough to get rid of that there. So, importantly, talking about antidotal therapy. Now, overall, given how many drugs do you think we've covered in farm so far? A, wow, a million. <laughs> Probably not too big of an exaggeration, but we've covered a lot, right? Now, how many of those have we talked about actually having antidotes to them? Not very many, right? We've covered more than two, right? We've got to cover several, right? We can reverse neuromuscular blockers. We can reverse heparin. We can reverse warfarin. Like, we can cover some drugs, right? Uh, that's at least three. Right there. Um, 
far and away, we're not going to have a lot of antidotes for the majority of substances we run across, right? And so, and in fact, that's actually one of the important services that the Poison Center can provide as well. I'll give you an example that just happened. This was Saturday night. I was on call for the Poison Center and actually had a PA call up. Basically, the case was, you had this, um, she was probably like in her 70s-year-old lady. She was showing up um, to the ER. She was taking, um, she had a history of coronary bypass, uh, not by that, she had stents, and she was on aspirin and she was on Plavix, okay? So where do you think I'm already going with this one? Probably bleeding, right? So again, she's on two antiplatelet agents. So she was supposed to go to church that morning, and she ended up having a fall, fell right on her face, and so then she ended up, um, you know, not making it to church, obviously, and so she sat around until finally someone came over to check on her and said, oh, wow, you need to go to the ER. So this was like nine o'clock at night by the time they're calling me. So this has been developing for a while there. And so basically she had this massive hematoma on her face. And the concern was, it's actually starting to spread down into her neck. And then once you get to there, what are you worried about? <coughs> we're starting by the airway starting to get in, uh, closed off there. Have I told you the story already? Okay, good. So anyway, so uh, so they're worried about this, uh, this evolving and say, oh, well, what can we do about this, right? Because again, if it had been warfarin, what could I tell them to, uh, to give the patient? You can vitamin K, right? I can give them fresh frozen plasma. I can do all sorts of things, right? Um, however, the, uh, the PA was calling up. They're like, well, we don't know what to do with this stuff. Like, is there anything we can do to reverse this? And so I said, well, that's why I got to tell a lot of people, unfortunately, not really, right? So with aspirin, what can you do for that? If you think about it, it's an irrever or irreversible inhibitor of that cycle oxygenase, right? So I can't really get rid of that effect. I have to wait for the new platelets to be produced. How about the Plavix? Anyone remember how that drug works? There's an ADP receptor antagonist, right? It's a P2Y12. Remember those, uh, trying to prevent that cross-linking between the platelets. And so I looked it up too, just to make sure there wasn't anything new that I wasn't aware of. But I looked it up, and sure enough, it says sometimes patients maybe give them additional infusions of platelets. But again, as soon as I put the platelets in, what's the concern? The clopidogrel is going to start to work on that too, right? So again, the idea is to kind of overwhelm it by giving enough platelets. So at that point, we said, okay, well, there's not a lot we can do. Now, other questions you want to ask is, is what? Regarding the drug specifically. Well, when did the patient last take her doses, right? You know, was it yesterday or was it today? Why would that make a difference? If it was yesterday, then I know that most of the plavix should be probably gone out of the system, right? You take it every single day versus when I asked me, he said, yeah, she'd actually taken it that morning. So again, it's all about kind of assessing your risk and be like, okay, well, I know the drug is still around. It's kind of getting later on in the dosing period. So I know the drug's probably starting to dissipate a little bit, but these are concerned, right? As opposed to if she'd just taken it, then I know that it's going to be much more concerning for that you know, that hematoma keeps spreading. So I said, okay, well, let's consider doing platelets. Otherwise, you just need the tincture of time, which is, you know, kind of the, the, the hokey term I use to say, like, you just got to give it time, right? Just give it time for the drug to metabolize and see how it goes. Now, at that point, I also want to make sure that they know that, okay, well, make sure you're talking to other people as well. So I also recommend they talk to the hematologist, uh, talk to them to see if they know anything maybe I don't know, or maybe if they have any recommendations on platelets, et cetera. So again, a lot of times we don't have antidotes for this stuff, but it's good to talk to someone who knows more than you do to say, yeah, you're right. There's nothing we can really do for it, right? Anywho, um, so antidotes here for this, what we're going to use. Uh, so atropine, what's atropine going to be good for? For the bradycardia, mm -hmm. what else? It's going to dry the patient out, right? So remember we talked about the bronchorrhea, the bronchospasm, by alleviating that muscarinic effect on there. And remember, uh, remember atropine only works on the muscarinic receptor. So is this going to do anything to the nicotinic effects? That answer is no. This does not do anything for nicotinic effects. So it's not going to help the diaphragmatic weakness. It's not going to help the hypertension. It's not going to help anything else, right? So it's just going to be for the anti-muscarinic effects you're trying to get out of that. So one's going to dry them out, right? It's going to help the heart rate perk back up. And those are good things, right? Because I want to make sure I'm oxygenating. I want to make sure I'm perfusing. Again, I don't really care if they're peeing or not. I don't really care if they're defecating or not, right? The nurses might care about that. But I really care about making sure they're actually perfusing and make sure they're breathing well. So um, that's one thing we're going to do for that. Um, and again, what are the side effects you'd expect to see if I were giving atropine for these patients? Tachycardia, you know, other things like constipation. The other things you're not really too worried about. If they had glaucoma, obviously that would be a concern as well. It could see increased intraocular pressures. But the big thing is just the tachycardia. A lot of people will give atropine, and once they see them get tachycardia, they say, okay, I can't give any more. That's not true. You want to make sure you have clear breath sounds. That's a big thing I want to look for when I'm uh, using atropine for these patients here. Now, the other thing we can do is give a drug called pralidoxine or 2PAM. A 2 pan, what this is actually going to do is we'll actually uh, liberate the organophosphate or the nerve agent from the acetylcholinesterase and instead bind to that preferentially. What that means is, is that if you can get this on before the aging process happens, then you're going to be able to save that enzyme 
rather than once the aging process has occurred, then you can't really do anything for it. So this is going to be really good to help. Uh, again, earlier on, the better, obviously, especially with uh, those nerve agents. If you get it on immediately, that's really good. And in fact, um, U.S. soldiers, there's actually something called uh, the Mark One kit they would carry around with them if they're in an area where they're really concerned about having um, some of these nerve agents being administered. So say you're out in the middle of the desert, all of a sudden you get sprayed with something, you don't know what it is, but you think it might be one of these nerve agents there. They actually have... It was an intramuscular auto-injector kit. We said to pull it out, and actually one of the drugs they would administer was 2-PAM. The other one would be atropine. By administering those both together, you go ahead and make sure you try to get that on board before the aging process actually occurs, right? So that would be for the actual trying to save the acetylcholinesterase and helping to block the muscarinic effects. Then for seizures, what can I do for them? Well, you treat it just like any other seizure, right, for the most part. Mainly, though, we're going to be seeing that we're working on benzo, uh, working with benzodiazepines. So I give them diazepam, I give them lorazepam, midazolam, any of those are fine, right? Usually per interval we're, we're administering here. If those are not working, then we can consider things like barbiturates, like what? Phenobarb is a good option. What else? Pentobarb, yeah, potentially use pentobarb. And then actually another one we're probably using a little bit more frequently than the barbiturates now is going to be propofol. That's another really good one we can uh, put on there. Now, again, these patients, you know, monitor the blood pressure because propofol is going to do what? Yeah, it's going to cause hypotension, if anything. So, again, if they're normal hypertensive, then propofol is going to be fine for that, okay? And actually, they... Um, Basically, the, the, for those military guys, they would have uh, the Mark I kits, and at a certain point, once they give themselves enough doses, they had something called the Cana kit. It actually had diazepam in it. They would administer that just to help uh, save off the, the seizures from occurring there, right? And you can think about, like, these had some really large needles on it because they had to go through all that combat gear and everything to make sure they actually get through that stuff. So uh, pretty interesting if you ever – you can look up Mark I kits and see those. Anywho. Um, as I mentioned, atropine is going to be only good for the muscarinic effects. So you're going to be using this to dry up the secretions. You want to make sure that clear breath sounds uh, on exam. Uh, and actually, some patients may actually need a drip. So if you ever see an atropine drip, it's probably something like this you're running into. It's not really the only case you'd ever see that being used. And I mentioned the uh, pralidoxine. You're going to be using this um, both as a bolus and by a continuous infusion. And then you actually will stop this after the last dose of atropine. Because once I've stopped atropine and the patient does not have any overt muscarinic signs anymore, then I know that, okay, well, I'm probably over the, the worst of it, and then you can stop the pralidoxin usually 12, 24 hours afterwards. Okay, so that makes sense? So again, if I have a patient who presents and they're complaining of difficulty breathing, but the lung sound still sounds okay, they're midriatic, but I know they're exposed to organophosphate, I don't have to give the atropine, right? I don't need to always give that, but the 2-PAM I always have to give if you're uh, suspecting one of these irreversible inhibitors, okay? This would not be used, 2PM would not be used for a reversible inhibitor. Those we can just give it time, right? Just allow for the drug to, to go away on its own. So on the flip side of that, we have the anticholinergics, right? Anyone know some examples of anticholinergics you may run into? Talked about a bunch of them already. Benadryl's a good one. TCA, tricyclic antidepressants such as? Amitriptyline, nortriptyline, doxepin. What else? Trazodone's uh, got some anticholinergic properties to it, right? How about our phenothiazines, like a lot of your first-generation antipsychotics are going to have anticholinergic properties. How about all the stuff we talked about for uh, for incontinence, right? Oxybutynin, tolteridine, all those agents there. We've, so we've covered a lot of anticholinergics. Um, just know there's also several um, natural products. There's actually plant-based products. Uh, if you ever uh, talk about the belladonna alkaloids, anyone know where that term belladonna comes from? Hmm? Used for Not used for uppers necessarily, but the term. Anyone know what that means? No one from Italy around here. Beautiful lady. Beautiful lady. Thank you. Yeah. So basically, back in the day, um, they would actually use some of these anticholinergic plants. They would actually get some t some tinctures made out of them, and they would actually put them in their eyes. And what do you know that does to the pupils? They get really midriatic. So they had these huge saucer-looking pupils there. Now, nowadays, if you saw a lady look like that, so say you're like out in the bar and a lady came up to you and was like, "Hey, how's it going?" And her pupils look like that you might be a little concerned, right? Back in the day, that was a very beautiful thing. They actually find that very pleasing. So that's what the term comes from, the belladonna alkaloids. It's just referencing all those anticholinergic kind of um, products there. Remember we talked about the, the transderm scope? Remember we talked about the scopolamine patients would use? Remember what was the good education for those patients using that? You know, wash your hands really good after using because remember the lady that had just rubbed one eye and said so she had one big midriatic pupil and the other one's normal? In that case, you probably think you probably have some kind of pontine bleed or something like that. Like, be really concerned, but um, make sure to wash your hands. So we have things like the uh, Jimson weed, Angel's Trumpet. Now, where might you find these, do you think? Now, these are plants. 
you find them in Florida pretty frequently, actually. There are a lot of, uh, you see these, a lot of ornamental plants. If you ever go in like, someone's backyard and they have a um, green thumb, you might find some angel's trumpet. Uh, people have made teas out of these. People have made salads out of these to try to get their anticholinergic properties. So some people will abuse these intentionally in order to try and get high. Um, antihistamines have also been used pretty frequently for that purpose as well. So think about things like chlorpheniramine, things like doxylamine, diphenhydramine, found in all these cough and cold products. It can be frequently used, especially by children or adolescents, uh, in order to abuse them to get high. Now, why do you think adolescents would be more likely to abuse cough and cold products than, say, like adults? Why? Easy to get access to, right? So again, people usually go the path of least resistance. So if I can go to the Walgreens and buy a whole bunch of cough and cold products, no one's going to bat an eye to it, right? Versus if I try to go, um, you know, get actual medicinal products or something like that, you know, get a prescription for something that's going to be a little bit more difficult. So you see that a lot. Um, you guys ever heard of uh, triple C's? Probably an older term. I don't know if they use too too frequently, but there is a um, the cough and cold product called uh, quercetin cough and cold, and so that's where the triple C comes from. And basically, it was meant for patients with high blood pressure because it didn't have any like phenylephrine or pseudoephedrine in it. Um, uh, uh, patients with adolescents, especially, would, would abuse this stuff. Basically, they would take, you know how like they uh, come out of the box and are kind of like in a plate, and you kind of punch each one out individually. Um, they would talk about how many plates of the triple C they did in terms of the dose they received. Right, so they're getting a lot of the stuff in here. I remember I had one patient. Um, they actually had several patients from the same party all show up at the ER at various times um, because they were using too much of this stuff. And I remember we had one patient who uh, was severely anticholinergic. Um, he'd done uh, three plates. He'd never done it before a day in his life, so he had no idea what his tolerance was or anything like that. So he did way too much. Um, and again, I, I probably mentioned this before, but a typical dose of Ativan to stop a seizure is how much? Anyone know? A two milligrams, right? This kid got 14 milligrams before he was sleeping, like before he would actually just like stop because he was very aggressive he was agitated he's having hallucinations he was very very hard to put down so we got seven times the normal dose we would use for a seizure just to get him to where he's kind of sleepy right still rousable so again it just goes to show you how very stimulating these, uh, these uh, products can be and they're so ubiquitous you can find them anywhere probably most of them you have in the home somewhere uh, that you can find exposure to this pretty commonly right so again, remember the mechanism here is mainly just going to be anti-muscarinic. These have no effects on the nicotinic receptors, right? So that's kind of the delineation here with the um, the cholinergic poisoning, especially the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. Those are mainly going to be causing both muscarinic and nicotinic effects here. These are only going to be causing anti-muscarinic effects. And what's our mnemonic? Why is a bat? Why is a hatter? Drives a beat. No, no, not drives a beat. Right as a beat. <laughs> drives a beats actually have. Some liquid in them. Dries a bone. bone. There you go. Hot as. Are hairs really that hot? I'd say hot as Hades. Hot as hell. Language, please. <laughs> yeah, any of those are going to work, right? Um, what other effects might you see, though? Tachycardia, right? They're going to become very, very tachycardic. That's one of the big things, probably one of the first things we're going to notice in those patients. You get very tachycardic. What else? Hmm? Bloated? Bloated? Bloated as a toad. Yeah, I guess you can see that because, again, what's it going to do to the GI tract? <laughs> Slow everything down, right? So it can cause constipation. You can see urinary retention. That's another big thing. If you put a full in these patients, also you can get two liters out. Like, that's giving me a pretty good sign they're holding on to a lot. Um, got anything else? So the mental status changes are a big one, right? Because this is why people are abusing it is in order to get high. So they will um, – initially, when you take a, a, a normal therapeutic dose of Benadryl, what do you see? It's just a day. Most people end up getting pretty sleepy on some, uh, like an anti-muscarinic like diphenhydramine. Um, once you start going much above that, that's where you start to get more of the excitation, the hallucinations, the delirium, and then eventually seizures, right? So again, these all end up leading usually to seizures. You're overexciting everything. Eventually, you get to that point. Uh, so those are the big things we're really concerned about. Again, they come in, and they are, and I'll talk about the differentials here in a second with some of the other toxidromes that look very similar to this, but they come in, they're just like, they just got a nasty dry mouth, and they just haven't peed in a while. Like These are little things you look for to try to say, okay, this maybe is an anticholinergic. Because if I have an adolescent who's coming in, they're at a party, they got caught, uh, they got really sick, and now they're in the ER, and I say, what did you take tonight? What are they going to say? Nothing. Where are we at tonight? Are they home? Really? Cops brought you in from the party. <laughs> So yeah, so you have to worry about them not really being all that truthful. And again, how can you tell if they're lying? Their lips are moving, right? It's basically the, the number one way we can tell. So that's why I don't even worry about what they're telling me. In a lot of cases, I worry about more what they're showing me, right? What they sound like, what they feel like, et cetera. So uh, again, as I mentioned, the Mad as a Hatter. Now, where does Mad as a Hatter, that term, really come from? I think Alice in Wonderland actually comes from something else. 
Mercury actually poison. the hatters is actually mercury poison. They use mercury to um, for part of the the hatting process, the fur they were messing with. Um, basically, they would end up getting mercury poisoning uh, from that. A lot of the vapors and stuff you would inhale. People actually making the hats, um, and so that, that's where they got the mad as a hatter um, term. Anyway, um, but yeah, they should see midriatic pupils. They should be complaining of difficulty, um, you know, kind of blurry vision because they can't really accommodate all that well. Should be hyperthermic. These are all going to be things you're kind of looking for. And again, I'll tell you, these are going to look very similar in some cases to the sympathomimetics. And so this is where it gets very difficult to differentiate the two. And the treatment is going to be a little different between the two as well, as we'll see. Okay, um, usually you're gonna see tachycardia. Usually blood pressure doesn't change too, too much. It may get a little hypertensive, a little hypotensive, but that's not the primary thing. It's really the tachycardia there. Um, you'll see uh, decreased bowel motility, seizures. Now, I say delayed absorption. Why might that be a problem? So what will happen is patients will take a whole bunch of an anticholinergic, right? And this is the same, uh, this holds true for opioids as well, um, that slow down the GI tract. They take a whole bunch of stuff, so they start to absorb some of it. They get the clinical effects from the drug, right? They either get high or they have whatever effects they end up having from it. And But the GI tract starts to slow down. So they can still have a bunch sitting there in the stomach that hasn't been absorbed yet. And then once that stuff that's in the system starts to dissipate, what happens? The GI tract starts to wake back up again, and guess what? All that drug that went unabsorbed is now being absorbed. So you kind of find this kind of bimodal sort of peak in the effects for, uh, for those patients. And so that's why one of the big things we always do is listen for bowel sounds. We want to make sure that they um, have active bowel sounds that le leads me to believe they should not be holding on to a bunch of extra uh, medication or drug in the, in the stomach, right? So as I mentioned, it, this has a wide differential diagnosis. So if I have a patient presents and they're hyperthermic, tachycardic, maybe dry mouth, you know, some of these uh, ultramental status, like there's a wide differential for this. And you can see, find that this will be um, mimicking things like sympathomimetics. Now, when I say sympathomimetics, what does that mean? Yeah, so things that mimic the sympathetic nervous system. So you mentioned Adderall, Ritalin, those are amphetamines. What else? So the other big one. Cocaine, right? Cocaine. The big one, crack cocaine, regular cocaine, whatever kind of cocaine you got, that's definitely going to be there. What, what other things? Pseudoephedrine, what else? Caffeine kind of fits in that category a little bit, right? So the different things that all fit into all those kind of categories there. Um, they look very similar to the anticholinergic toxidrome. That's why it's kind of hard to tell the difference between them in some cases. Withdrawal syndromes, especially withdrawal from sedatives like benzodiazepines will look like this. Uh, NMS, what causes NMS? Or antipsychotics like Haldol, right? Remember, uh, remember that develops that lead pipe rigidity. They get very hyperthermic and develop rhabdo. Like, again, it looks very similar here. Serotonin syndrome, obviously, what causes that? SSRIs, SNRIs, TCAs can all lead to that. Sepsis, adrenergic access, fievrochromocytoma, thyroid storm, all that can look very similar to something like an anticholinergic toxicity. So that's why you got to start to rule some of this stuff out, right? So again, you're going to be getting a lot of labs that kind of help you out with that. So as far as treatment goes, ABCs are going to be the big thing. We'll talk about GI decontamination a little bit later. It'll be the, one of the other sections in this um, thing here. But when I say GI decontamination, what does that mean to you, you think? Is where charcoal is going to come into play? What else? Yeah, I was talking about things like lavage, like to pump the stomach, so to speak. Ipecac, we'll talk about Ipecac a little bit. Some of these things we actually don't do too frequently anymore, but we'll talk about some of the whole about irrigation. We'll also talk about it a little bit. So we'll get into those a little bit later on, but we'll talk about when that's appropriate. Um, if they're having agitation and seizures, you just give them benzodiazepines. Um, basically, there is no max dose you can give on that. Just kind of give it until they are either not a harm to themselves or others, they're lightly sleeping. Any of those are totally fine, right? Um, as far as the tachycardia goes, you can do fluids, you can do some benzodiazepines to kind of help chill them out from that standpoint as well a little bit. That can be useful. And then the antidote, we do have one. It's called physostigmine. And physostigmine does what? We just saw it in the previous couple slides. Cetocholinesterase inhibitor. You can actually use it. It's in the same family as something like pyridostigmine or neostigmine. Physostigmine will block acetylcholinesterase. So if I have something that's sitting on the acetylcholine receptor, the muscarinic receptor blocking Anything else, like acetylcholine from interacting with it, if I increase levels of acetylcholine, it'll go and kick that drug off, and then you have normal transmission again. This one has kind of a lot of uh, negative stigma associated with it. Some people feel like it uh, falsely believe that it would lead you to having fatal arrhythmia, so we don't use it too frequently, but that is, if you get asked on the board style question or something, just know physostigmine is the antidote for an anticholinergic poisoning. Okay. I mentioned it's a reversible inhibitor. Obviously, we would not want to use an irreversible inhibitor for those patients there because then we'd be in the other boat uh, for, as far as uh, cholinergic poison goes. And you're going to find that not only, though, are you going to get 
the muscarinic effects taken care of, but you will see some of the nicotinic effects, some of those other effects you're going to see from that, right? So you do have to worry about kind of overdoing it with the physostigmine and causing kind of the opposite effects there. Now, again, if I were to give an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor like physostigmine, what might I worry about the heart rate doing? They come in tachycardic, but then I give them this and then they become... Yeah, so you got to worry about kind of going the other side of things and getting too cholinergic because uh, then that leads you into the opposite problem, right? Now, again, um, sometimes we'll actually use this if patients have refractory seizures or psychosis, if they're unresponsive to benzodiazepines, unresponsive to uh, propofol. Sometimes we've used this in order to help kind of um, to, to fix that issue there. So I remember one case I had, uh, there was a, as a teenager, he'd gotten into some Jimson weed ate a bunch of that, came in, he was an SVT, he was very altered, um, and we kept giving him benzos and fluids and really nothing was doing it. So we said, all right, well, let's try some FISO, let's try it. Uh, so we gave it to him and it broke it almost immediately. It was, it was pretty uh, pretty effective in, in doing that. So again, not used too, uh, too, uh, too commonly, but you may see every once in a while. Again, just avoid too rapid of administration because you do worry about the more cholinergic symptoms, both nicotinic and muscarinic you're worried about. So bradycardia, hypersalivation, seizures, et cetera, can all happen there. Um, and again, may take a few minutes to kind of kick in, but once it's there, it should be pretty effective for that. But again, you have to identify, is this truly an anticholinergic or is it something else? Because if it came in and it was actually cocaine, then that's not really going to be that effective for it. Okay, so about 10 minutes left for the hour but I'm feeling quite generous. It is Good Friday, right? So they say. Let's make it an even better Friday. Do you guys have any questions before I wrap it up? <laughs> that was my present to you. I wasn't going to get a full four hours. I was actually going to go one hour, but... Just remember my reviews, you know? Just kidding. Okay, no. Be honest on those. Um, no, any questions though before I, let you, I, I just don't want to get into this topic because again, it's going to be kind of a big one. So I want to give it me, give myself some time later on. Now let me check the board real quick. See if there's any questions. Anyone wrote up? <laughs> Nothing. Up. Oh my goodness. Wait till you see your test. Don't, don't think of me just yet. Okay, that's it. Uh, guys, have a great Easter. Or if you celebrate that, if not, have a great Sunday. I'll see you guys later.